executives they tend to think of jay-z master p diddy russell simmons or birdman however people always seem to not mention steve rifkin it can be understood since he's maintained a low celebrity profile over the years in comparison to other execs mentioned turned out crazy big event twenty thousand. it's the rock you bastard i ain't gonna say it no more put some respect on my name however even in hip-hop he really doesn't get recognition Outside of hardcore hip hop heads and hip hop figures, no one really talks about him. He's gotten a little buzz because of recent interviews, but they still don't seem to capture his impact and contributions to the culture. That's what I strive to do with this video series. Pay respect to one of hip hop and music's most underrated executives. Rifkin has always been involved in hip hop and music since his early teens. The reason stemming from the fact his dad was Jules Rifkin, founder of any label Spring Records. Spring Records house soul and R&B acts such as Millie Jackson, Jocelyn Brown, and Paul Evans. Jewels also helped James Brown arrange his first major record deal. However, the biggest takeaway for Steve during this era was him and his dad promoting the Fatback Band. The Fatback Band's King Tim III was the very first commercially released rap song. Most people consider Rappers of Light by the Sugar Hill Gang to be the first, but that isn't exactly true. King Tim III was released on March 25th, 1979, while Rappers of Light was released on September 16th, 1970. Rappers of Light, however, was the first rap song commercially released by a group. For Rifkin and his father to promote this record, it helped hip hop be recognized outside the boroughs of New York to a whole new frontier across the US. This is a huge risk as almost nobody knew what rap was outside of New York. Of course, the risk was a huge payoff as it helped spearhead the culture on a national scale. Once Rifkin left his father's record label, he ended up managing R&B group New Edition in the late 80s. After his short tenure with the group, Rifkin decided to start his own business and thus the Steve Rifkin Company was founded. The company would promote legendary hip hop groups such as Boogie Down Productions and Leaders of the New School. Rifkin's promotion networks had gotten so strong that he promoted anything hip hop, even if the artist was from a major or indie label. Some examples include RCA, Warner, Electra, and Delicious Vinyl. West Coast indie label Delicious Vinyl is known for having a legendary alternative hip hop group The Far Side and the one hit wonder. <sighs> Tone Loke. <laughs> Which knew about that But like Mick Jagger said, I can't. I wanna go Even though Rifkin was successful through his traditional promotion style, it wasn't enough. This included promoting through retail, radio, and video. There was a missing element to his formula, and that was the streets. For Rifkin to truly make an impact within the culture, he'd have to make a connection to the streets. Thus, he formed the infamous street team. Street teams are a group of people who help promote and or discover a music artist from an underground setting. Back in the day, this was done by attending local events, creating flyers, CDs, and posters. The street teams are the bridge between the tastemakers and the labels. If something is hot in the streets, the team will be the first to know. The street team can also be tastemakers themselves and have been known to discover numerous legendary hip-hop artists. Steve Rifkin is considered to have created the street teams. Other hip-hop labels of the 90s such as Death Row, Bad Boy, Rockefeller, No Limit, and Cash Money had their own street teams following Rifkin's blueprint. Hey, yo, yo, they say that Bad Boy invented the street team. Mm. But Let's get to it. Yeah, but the, but the fact of the matter is Steve Rifkin mm. invented the street team. Mm. Came and let me get some information. Always was a brother to share. And, um, you know, we just really was able to implement his teachings. And I think it really has given birth to a, another level of entrepreneurialism, you know what I'm saying? How we could go directly to our community. And I would have to say he's, he's the founding father of that. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Steve Rifkin. <laughs> Nowadays, street teams have become acquainted with discovering and promoting artists through the lens of social media. An example of the evolution of street teams can be found through the late ASAP Yan. Yams was the ultimate tastemaker, guru, fashionista, and young mogul of Harlem during his era. 
spending hours on end studying and observing the culture bestowed upon him in the streets and social media. At the age of 16, he was interning at Diplomat Records. A few years later, Yams created his own Tumblr account and used the Tumblr account to not only market himself, but his hip-hop collective ASAP Mob. The rest is history. And the legacy of ASAP Mob is a video in and of itself. To say Rifkin was successful with his street teams is truly an understatement. He pretty much had the entire streets on lock and his teams knew how to deliver product effectively. I, I want to say, literally from 1987 to 1999, the only two labels, maybe, was Death Row, we didn't do anything, but we did a shitload for Interscope. Um, Puff, we didn't, Puff, I would just help as a friend, um, but didn't do anything. And once in a blue moon, Def Jam. But every, everything else, from Warner to Atlantic to Electra to EMI to Capital, we were on retainer. Through Riffian Street Conglomerate, he would eventually found Loud Records with childhood friend Rich Isaacson in 1991. Loud stands for Listeners of Urban Dialect. This led the world to win as one of the fastest rappers in history, Twista. Twista, known as Tongue Twista, was the first artist signed to Loud. Because of Twister's ability to rap at such a fast rate, Rifkin immediately caught a representative for the Games Book Award record. <laughs> that call alone cemented Twister as the fastest rapper alive for 10 straight years. It was also one of the first times, if not the first time, the world had witnessed a rapper from Chicago get any buzz. After Twister were hip hop groups Madcap and the Alcoholics. These groups are severely underrated and do not get the respect they deserve. I highly recommend you check out their discography as it won't disappoint. All three acts were successful, selling over 100,000 each. Brother, their kung fu is first class. Hmm. Shaolin shadow boxing. And a Wu Tang sword style. On guard. I'll let you try my Wu Tang style. The next group to be signed under Loud will be the Sons of Shaolin, the Wu Tang Clan. Rifkin and his street team had heard the clans protecting that record, but Rifkin hadn't personally met any of the members at that point. Rifkin had been trying to get in contact with the group for a couple months, but to no reply. Unexpectedly, Rizza, known as Prince Rakim at the time, randomly showed up and interrupted a meeting Rifkin was having with Alcoholics member j Row on his 31st birthday. Rizza was subsequently followed by each member of the group, and they rapped to the instrument of protecting that brought by Rizza on his boombox. They were immediately signed after the presentation, but there was a catch. RZA established a deal with Loud to launch each artist to get a solo record deal. This is revolutionary as no hip hop group had architected a deal like this before. The deal resulted in some of the most critically and culturally impactful solo albums in hip hop history. After the deal was completed, the group would work on the legendary Enter the 36 Chambers. The sheer raw energy, superb all-star cast lyricism, grimy production, and kung fu samples were unlike anything heard before. Enter the 36 Chambers has probably one of the hardest intros to an album ever with Bring the Ruckus. The album will also include classic tracks such as Method Man, Cream, Tears, and Protect Your Neck. It would eventually sell 2 million records with singles Cream and Method Man being the fuel. After the success of Wu-Tang, two young rappers from Queensbridge were about to make their name heard at Loud. Mob Deep had already released an album, Juvenile Hell. While the album in retrospect was an above average release, it wasn't received too well at the time. This led the group to leave the label fourth and B-Way. Thanks to Loud's street teams, Rifkin would eventually catch wind of the duo and sign them. This led to arguably the group's most popular song, Shook Ones Part 2, an irrefutable classic known for its rough production style with lyrics to match. I got you stuck off the realness. We be the infamous, you heard of us. Official Queensbridge murderers. The mob comes equipped for warfare. Beware of my crime family who got enough shots. The 1995 album The Infamous would also be another classic, doing well on both a commercial and critical level. Along with Into the 36 Chambers, it's considered to be one of the greatest hip hop albums ever made. Towards the late 90s, Loud will receive tremendous success. This era included highly anticipated veteran projects and a new brand of artistry for the world to witness. These albums include Wu-Tang Forever, Hell on Earth, 40 Days and 40 Nights, Capital Punishment, and Liquidation. Out of all the veteran albums mentioned, none were more so anticipated than Wu-Tang Forever. The album would debut at number one and generate over $120 million. The album was dope to say the least and showcased the group's flashier aesthetic in comparison to the grimier one on Into the 36. 
The production still had the Wu-Tang sound, just slightly more polished, which if anything showed Rich's growth as a producer since he had produced also the Wu-Tang albums up until that point. This album also solidified Wu-Tang as an international powerhouse, receiving much love overseas, particularly in the UK. Rapper Akala has spoken very fondly of the album as it's impacted him on a deep level. Back now, that album, now a lot of people prefer 36 Chambers, I get that, but I was nine when 36 Chambers came out, so. I've li retrospectively, I think it's a great record, and I know Wu-Tang Forever got slept on a lot in the States, but for me here, number one, it was the first rap album to go number one in the UK. It was the first hip-hop album that, it seemed in my childhood, united everybody. Even if we listened to, you know, the people who were listening to Oasis and Nirvana or Blur or whatever else, Wu-Tang was the first record that got everyone's attention, but was still authentically hood. It wasn't trying to be an alternative music album. It just was the level of poetry was that strong and that good that it seemed to pull everyone in. And everyone was just like, wow, in awe of these guys. And, and so what struck me about Wu-Tang was the level of unapologetic poetry from these guys. They didn't dress differently. They didn't speak differently. They didn't try and not be who they were. Some of them have been to prison. Some have been shot. Some have sold drugs. They had a, you know, cliche hip hop upbringing, right? A ghetto upbringing in the projects in New York at least most of them. And yet here they were using words like benevolent in, in rap songs. Mm. And I just found that amazing. And I, I mean, I wrote out the lyrics to all 28 songs. It's a double. It's hard to say that without Rifkin's genius promotion that the entire world would have appreciated and looked at Wu-Tang the same. This helped the world see how amazing hip hop culture truly was and reach people who may not have been aware of the culture or had ignorant perspective towards it. This isn't to say anything about the quality of the album as it was extremely dope. However, if one cuts down a tree in the middle of nowhere, who truly hears the impact? This album also pushed Wu-Tang's symbol to be one of the most recognized music locals in the world. It is by far the most recognized and arguably the dopest local in the culture. The new brand of artist she allowed unlike anything I heard before. This brand's highlights were Exhibit and the late great Big Pun. Both of these artists had strong underground rep before being signed. Exhibit had that deep voice, hard rock, slightly witty, energy spiking, punchline driven style. I consider Exhibit not a legend, but a very underrated rapper to say the least. His first two albums are really good and have a very unique style to them. His flow, especially in the case of his third album, can be considered very reminiscent of hip hop group Westside Connection. I'm not too fond of his album, despite his popularity. As for Big Pun, well, he was a lyrical genius. No diss exhibit, but Pun was better in almost every way. He's hands down one of the greatest lyricists to ever grace the mic, and his flow was ridiculous. It's Big Pun, the one and only son of Tony, Montana. You oh. ain't promised mañana in the rotten Montana. Come on, Pana, we need more robbers. Fill him out and want a snake bite. Anaconda, a man of honor would want to try to bash my persona. Sometimes robbing, I blow my own mind like Nirvana. Come on. <laughs> Go try to find another rhyme with my kind of drama. I'm pure adrenaline, uncut, straight to the gut, medicine, raw cure for pain. I coach your brain like polyurethane, simple to play. I'll explain it in layman terms. If you came to learn how to make fire, I'ma make it burn. He was just on point in every angle, whether it was his wordplay, delivery, punchlines, you name it. Pun covered it and it was fucking dope. After developing Buzz in the underground with his crew and collaborating with Fat Joe, he eventually landed a deal with Loud by 1997. By this time, Exhibit had already released his debut album, and Pun was ready to drop his. Capital Punishment showcased the dominant force Pun was in the underground to the whole world. Songs like Still Not a Player incorporated the Diddy R&B rap radio formula from the mid-90s but perfected it. Pun's airtight lyricism matching Joe's soulful hook was a match made in heaven. A classic song enjoyed by all to this very day. In terms of sheer lyricism, Pun displayed that on songs like You Ain't a Killer, Super Lyrical, and Twins. Twins is paying homage to Dre and Snoop by covering their 91 underrated but classic track Deep Cover. Fat Joe and Big Pun of course likes to try like every other song on this album. However, the only difference with this song is how it features one of Pun's most memorable verses. Dead in the middle of little, literally little, did we know that we riddle to middle, middle, didn't do diddle. Another aspect of Pun's rap style were his masterful internal rhyme schemes. An internal rhyme scheme is a pattern of rhyming words inside the same line. Pun showcases this very well in Fat Joe's 1998 track Triplets. Capital Punishment are going to be the first solo Latin hip hop record to go platinum.
The next acts to come under Loud would be Dead Prez and 36 Mafia. By this time, however, Loud was being sold to Sony. The origin of 36 Science allowed Sam from Rifkin being inspired by rap moguls, Master P's dominance in the South. P was selling millions of albums and was recouping those sales better than any artist at the time. Intrigued by the success, he decided to sign Memphis based group 36 Mafia. 36 is probably one of the most underrated hip hop groups ever. I know there's been a recent trend in hip hop and urban culture to pay homage to them, but man, no one really gives them their props for real. Their production and lyrical style is ingenious and innovative. Sometimes that is a backdrop innovation though, as your work can be so ahead of its time it may not be appreciated until generations later. A prime example of that would be the Triple Flow and the 808's drum machine, both of which are commonly used in hip hop today. Box is how the Triple Flow took over rap explains these concepts pretty well. Another aspect of why 3 Sick Monster is so dope is how they kept their publishing, something that most modern artists still don't own to this very day. It also shows the type of character Steve was as well since most execs wouldn't even touch artists who aren't willing to sell their publishing to the label. Talking to two labels, we was talking to uh, Jive Records and we was talking to Relativity Records, and um, I was sitting in um, in this apartment that I was living in at the time, and uh, I was looking over both of the contracts, and Juice just called me. He was like, "What did they say?" I said, "One of them said they'd give us an extra two hundred fifty thousand dollars up front, but they want like twenty five percent of the publishing." And then the other one said that uh, you know they didn't want. They would give us less money, less two hundred fifty thousand dollars up front, but um, and they didn't want no publishing, so we ended up going relativity, and uh, and that's basically what it was. Under Loud, three six were released the album when the smoke clears sixty six sixty one. This will feature the classic club banger sipping on some syrup and would eventually go platinum. After signing his last artist, Little Flip, Rifkin would leave Loud in two thousand and two. His reasoning stemmed from his strong dislike of corporate culture and lack of control overall. It went from a passionate urban house of culture to a typical music corporate environment. By the early 2000s, one can notice a shift in corporate involvement, <coughs> culture vultures, and hip hop. A similar situation that was happening at Def Jam at the time. All of y'all yesterday, why nobody told me about a marketing plan about Jay-Z? This is not your fucking artist. Y'all don't do nothing for Jay-Z without me. What the fuck? That's why y'all trying to make this like, oh, that's also, are y'all the ones promoting me and him got a beat too? Because we don't. How y'all got a meeting about Jay without me? How y'all make any decisions about Jay without me? Huh, John? After leaving Loud, Rifkin would break out artists such as David Banner, Melanie Fiona, Astor Roth, and Akon through his new label, SRC Records. I truly don't believe Rifkin was a vulture. The man has love and respect from a lot of hip hop figures, whether it be from the artists he signed to his fellow contemporaries. He's been down for the culture before Sugar Hill even dropped their own project. He promoted the first hip hop record for Christ's sakes. Even what Steve lacked in A&R skills, he made up for it through his creation of the street team. Which leads to my next point. Shout out to all the A&Rs and street teams from the past to today. You all are truly appreciated as you kept hip hop a truly authentic culture. One that didn't need pompous music execs dictating what's hot or not, but leaving that dictation to the streets, where the culture truly is. Hey everyone, thanks for watching this video. Like and subscribe. This is the first video we ever made in this style officially, so your honesty is crucial to the growth of this channel and brand. Follow us on Twitter. We post daily history and original content on these platforms too. This is not an exaggeration, as you'll know what happened in history and all the mediums we cover from hip hop, animation, film, basketball, etc. You'll know it. Um, links are in the description. I also want to give a shout out to my co-producer Scott Comics and business partner Phoenix for helping putting this video together. Also want to give a shout out to the homie Nova Blue for the super dope intro beat. If you like the instrumental, you can find him on SoundCloud at Nova Blue. Also check out his art collective he's a part of called BHC, aka Bleeding Hearts Club. Links to both will be in the description. Thank you.